On this week's show, the subtleties of sports psychology, the overtraining syndrome, and the genetic basis of athletic performance. A healthy mind and a healthy body. That maxim of the Roman poet Juvenal is 2,000 years old. Proof that mental skills have long been considered inseparable from physical performance. Athletes who participate in today's Olympic Games have all trained with equal intensity. Their physical skills are comparable, but their fitness, usually at its peak, is not enough to earn them all a gold medal. What distinguishes an ordinary athlete from a world champion is mainly the psyche. Psychology has thus become an integral part of every elite athlete's normal training, right alongside weightlifting and nutrition. All athletes who compete dream of winning a medal. This objective motivates them to train hard and to surpass themselves. But the psychologists recommend that athletes also set themselves short-term goals. A diver, for example, decides to correct the position of her hands. If she succeeds, she will feel she has made progress, even though she may have failed some other aspect of her dive. Simply achieving that small goal encourages her and helps maintain her will to win. The athlete must also learn to focus solely on the things she can control at any given moment. For example, she must remain alert and concentrate on her muscle tension as well as on the movements she performs. The athlete also has to control her thoughts. One technique that can help her do this is auto-suggestion. Auto-suggestion consists of the athlete's self-encouragement. The athlete convinces himself that he is ready, relaxed, and sure to succeed. However, an athlete must not let himself be distracted by situations over which he has no control, such as trainers' comments, or the performance and behavior of the other competitors. And he must also disregard the spectators. The ability to maintain intense concentration is a major asset when it comes to succeeding in a sports event. This is especially true in disciplines which require great precision, such as archery. Scientists have proven that in moments of intense concentration, brain wave patterns change. The brain emits various types of waves which are associated with specific states of alertness. Just as an archer is about to release his arrow, a burst of alpha waves flows into the left hemisphere of his brain. Such cerebral changes sometimes put the archer into a relaxed, trance-like state. There is a strategy athletes can use to achieve that state of deep concentration. It consists in repeating a series of motions before each performance. For instance, the archer plants his feet in a specific position, takes an arrow, and places it on the bow. He places his finger on the string and positions his bow at the right height for his aim. This ritual triggers the automatic processes the athlete developed during his training. Mechanically, the archer breathes in deeply. He then exhales slowly, stopping just as he releases his arrow. He then exhales completely, extending his movement in the direction of the arrow. Elite archers are able to attain such a high level of concentration they can shoot between heartbeats. This way they avoid the muscle twitch that occurs with every heartbeat. Some athletes are even able to slow down their heart rate, but they are rare.
Mental imagery is another technique that enables athletes to program and refine these automatic processes. Through imagery, the diver can visualize the various stages of a complex movement in her mind. When learning to use mental imagery, the athlete imagines her performance from the point of view of a spectator. Then she focuses back on her body. She therefore imagines all the sensations she feels when in the heat of action. She sees the water in the pool, hears the crowd, feels her muscles tense. If her dive is less than perfect, she will perceive her failure. If this is the case, she does it again in her mind until she gets it right. Researchers have observed that the use of mental imagery triggers activity in the regions of the brain, which are normally called into play during the actual performance of the motions. Only the motor cortex, which actually directs the muscles, does not respond. Mental imagery also induces a certain amount of electrical activity in the muscles used when the movement is performed. Stress is another factor that can have a determining effect on an athlete's performance during competition. To cope with stress, athletes use mental imagery to relive their best performances in their mind. They also use breathing techniques to help them relax, and most of them follow relaxation sessions on a regular basis. At present, specialists agree that close to 85% of an athlete's performance is determined by his degree of confidence, concentration, anxiety, and motivation. We know, of course, that a healthy mind does not in itself guarantee a healthy body. This requires judiciously planned physical training. Judiciously. Because as the intensity of the effort is increased, so do the chances of injury. The training that elite athletes undergo is very hard on the system. The athletes put their muscles through grueling exercises four to six hours a day. Intense training that does not include periods of rest or is performed in unfavorable conditions can have dire consequences. First, working the muscles produces large amounts of heat. The heat is expelled by various means, including perspiration. body then takes water from the blood. To this water are added sodium, potassium, urea, and lactic acid. The sweat glands then deposit this solution on the skin surface. When it evaporates, sweat produces a refreshing effect. Indeed, water needs heat to become vapor. It takes that heat from the skin. However, when there is a lot of humidity in the air, the sweat does not evaporate well. If, in addition, the temperature is sweltering, the athlete may suffer a heat stroke. A heat stroke results from dehydration and a rise in body temperature. In situations like these, the sweat glands can produce up to a liter and a half of sweat an hour without even lowering the body temperature in the process. Excessive water loss causes a decrease in blood volume. In extreme cases, that water loss can lead to cardiac insufficiency and even cardiac arrest. One of the first symptoms of dehydration is cramp. This involuntary and continuous contraction of a muscle usually occurs as a result of a lack of sodium and calcium ions, as occurs when a person perspires profusely. Track training can also result in substantial iron loss. Indeed, when the foot strikes the ground, the impact crushes numerous capillaries in the sole of the foot. The red cells circulating in these tiny blood vessels are destroyed. 
The iron included in the composition of the red cells is therefore also lost. Intense muscular exercise also damages the capillaries in the intestines and causes microscopic bleeding. While this bleeding is not dangerous, it too causes an iron loss. In addition, a considerable amount of iron is expelled in sweat, and women athletes suffer an additional iron loss through the menses. These various iron losses can result in anemia. An athlete who suffers from anemia experiences great fatigue and is easily winded. Iron is a crucial component of hemoglobin, the oxygen-bearing protein in red blood cells. Since a shortage of iron reduces the production of hemoglobin, less oxygen may be reaching the muscles. To prevent anemia, it is recommended that athletes' diets be high in meat and in some cases include an iron supplement. Heavy training can also cause hormonal disorders. A woman marathoner who has little fat reserves and is subjected to considerable stress in her life may be particularly prone to hormonal imbalance. For women athletes, training can disrupt the hormonal secretions of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which affect the ovaries. In addition to preventing ovulation, these disruptions may even result in amenorrhea, that is a complete cessation of the menses. Nothing indicates that disorders of the menstrual cycle jeopardize the fertility of women athletes, but they can have serious repercussions on their skeleton. A lack of estrogen, a hormone produced by the ovary, causes a weakening of the bones. This can lead to osteoporosis, a gradual decrease of bone mass. Osteoporosis makes athletes vulnerable to stress fractures. Caused by repeated impacts against the ground, this type of fracture is the sum of repetitive stress injuries. Repetitive stress injuries end up producing a hairline fracture, which is a fracture without separation of the bone segments. Very painful stress fractures are most common in the bones of the foot and the tibia. The marathoner who runs between 150 and 200 kilometers a week is particularly prone to such injuries. One way of preventing these kinds of injuries is to wear a good sports shoe. These shoes will reduce the heel's impact against the ground 10 to 50 percent. In road racing, for example, the foot absorbs impacts which can be three times the runner's body weight. As for the impact on landing from a successful jump, it can be up to nine times the body weight. The secret of a good training program is to pay as much attention to recovery as to effort. Rest enables the body to adapt to the conditions of training. If an athlete fails to rest sufficiently, he may fall victim to the overtraining syndrome. The signs of overtraining are prolonged fatigue, underperformance, and depression lasting several days. Hence the importance of a well-structured training program. Athletes have an absolute obsession with record setting. How long will they be able to outstrip their predecessors' performances? Well, the answer may already lie in certain genetics laboratories where research is trying to pinpoint the genes that determine athletic excellence. How is it that for equal training, some athletes manage to set records while others never quite make the grade? A number of signs lead us to believe that champions may be genetically predisposed to winning. In most sports, the performances by men have always surpassed those by women. This difference is mainly attributable to the genetic differences between the sexes. First of all, a woman's muscular mass is only two-thirds that of a man. 
Indeed, testosterone, the main male sexual hormone, promotes the development of muscular mass in men. The production of this genetically determined hormone accounts in part for the difference between female and male performances. Another factor which applies in endurance and resistance tests is the maximal oxygen uptake, or VO2 max. VO2 max relates to the body's ability to take in, transport, and use the oxygen in the air. The oxygen is used to convert sugars and fats into energy the muscles can use, and VO2 max values are clearly higher in men than in women. Testosterone promotes a greater production of hemoglobin in men. The amount of hemoglobin is what largely determines the capacity to transport oxygen. Because of these differences which give men an advantage, the athletes who participate in the women's events of Olympic Games are required to take a test to verify their gender. In use since 1968, this test is primarily intended to uncover men masquerading as women. It consists in extracting a sample of the women's inner cheek cells. The cells are placed on a glass slide and colored. In women's cells, the coloring reveals a small dark mass clinging to the nucleus of each cell. That mass, called Barr's body, is visible under a microscope. The ethical value of the test is, however, debatable. Roughly one woman athlete in 500 carries the male sexual chromosomes XY instead of the female XX chromosomes. And yet, these athletes have the physical appearance of normal women. Indeed, while their bodies produce testosterone, their cells are not sensitive to that hormone. They therefore do not have any of the muscular advantages male athletes do, even if the test identified them as men. But besides these differences between the sexes, it is believed that other aspects of athletic performance are genetically determined in all athletes, men and women. Scientists are currently trying to identify these characteristics. One is the composition of the muscle. All muscle fibers do not have the same properties. Some are fatigue resistant and slow contracting. Others are programmed for fast and powerful contractions. The relative proportions of these fast and slow fibers vary from one individual to another. The great black sprinters, for example, have a higher proportion of fast muscle fibers than do their white counterparts. This feature would in part be influenced by their genetic makeup. It may explain why these athletes are the uncontested champions of speed and sprinting. Another aspect of performance that seems to be programmed in the genes is response to training. In some people, training has very little effect on performance. However, in others, similar training will significantly enhance their athletic performance. Such people, thought to be genetically predisposed, increase their VO2 max substantially more than others. The conversion of fats and sugars into energy is also thought to be more intense in these individuals. Their muscles would therefore benefit from a more efficient supply of energy. Scientists are now studying genes to find characteristics that might be associated with high performance. For instance, they measure the performance of a subject while he trains on an exercise bicycle. They collect a muscle sample from the subject. and measure the activity of certain enzymes in the sample. 
More specifically, they study the activity of two enzymes which promote the production of energy in muscles. This factor is a good indicator of a person's level of performance. Through their tests, scientists observed that the activity of these enzymes was more intense in people with high physical performance levels. In the final stage of the research, molecular biologists are trying to find genetic characteristics in the subject studied which might account for the differences observed. If they are successful, we would be able to distinguish potentially high-performing people from others. As a result of these tests, the day may come when athletes are chosen at a very early age based on their genetic makeup. Super motivated, hyper trained, genetically selected. Tomorrow's athletes may well make us forget the old saying, it's not that you win or lose, it's how you play the game.